everybody this is anjali your moderator for today also heading the sales and marketing division for immigration speed presented by my legal software my legal software is a case management software today is thursday august 18th and we are here with our second webinar we are going to talk about how to make money by adding immigration law to your practice so if you are a new lawyer and experienced immigration lawyer someone who is looking to expand their area of practice a paralegal or hr in a law firm or a college pass out stay with us till the end there are some tips and tricks that can help you save your valuable time and money it's my request to all the attendees that in case if you want to ask any questions you can put your questions in the q and a section on your screen we'll answer all your questions at the end alternatively you can also email your questions to us on legal questions at the rate mylegalsoftware.com you'd be happy to know that attendees have a chance to win a gift hamper from my legal software all you have to do is take a screenshot or picture of this session and post it on your linkedin instagram and facebook account all you have to do is tag us along also any advice shared during the webinar does not account to a legal advice information given in the session is general in nature today as a guest speaker we have with us a legal influencer personal legal advisor of the president of suriname mr naresh gehi mr Hello. gehi is a cited expert by cnn abc world news fox news and is featured in forbes magazine he is also a regular speaker on wpix 11 for the latest immigration news he is presented many high profile celebrities and politicians Mr Gehi is a permanent attorney with the decades of experience and has worked with many difficult clients and cases. He is a speaker for federal practice and New York state practice. To distribute his learnings, he also wrote a book Immigration for Everyone. Recipient of many New York awards and who has worked with former committee of president William Quint. Welcome Mr Gehi. and i'd like to give you a couple of minutes to uh, tell us something about yourself and also uh, how can we actually make money by adding immigration law oh uh, first thing it's uh, wonderful being in this show and uh, you know it's just so nice to be here and the best thing that uh, we all are going to kind of enjoy here is that we all include audience will be participating with us and uh, we're going to talk about different areas of the law and for some time we are going to focus on immigration the reason we chose immigration is because there's a tremendous demand for immigration these days throughout the nation so i said let's first begin with our series on immigration then later on we are going to talk about divorces in new york plus we'll talk about a federal practice especially federal rules of civil procedure and federal rules of evidence so everyone can benefit from these sessions so you don't have to be an immigration lawyer in future you can be anyone who can actually kind of come in and join us and we all can exchange ideas and make things work so a little bit about myself uh, i've been an immigration practice uh, for a long time to make a long story short i practice at least in 90% of the immigration areas so except for one or two you know what i mean uh, there are always exceptions to the rule but uh, right from employment based immigration right from federal uh, federal litigation and immigration courts talk about bi briefs talking about immigration judge just appearances before the EOIR or USCIS of course in cases we've done it all and besides that in our firm we totally have close to 85 people working with us and uh, thanks to technology on the whole for making this happen uh thanks to a fantastic team that works with us and now what i've decided is to kind of share my personal secrets of how i was successful and how lawyers who are here today and there are let's break this down into categories of lawyers so i always like to hit the nail on the head number one are those who just retired from the jobs who have resigned from the jobs and they've said you know what i just want to work for myself immigration may be a good kind of avenue for you to make very good money that's number one second are people who are actually practicing immigration law and these are the people like you know for example you're doing employment based immigration but you're getting that client in your door who's coming in for an asylum 
and he's walking away because you feel you don't have the knowledge and you do not know where should I turn around to if I have a question. So if you are an immigration lawyer and if you want to expand your practice, that's what I'll be doing in these regular sessions. And the third category of people are those who work for law firms and they want to start an immigration department. For example, you're a personal injury lawyer. You're a matrimonial lawyer. Immigration is a good way for you to expand and make sure you build on that, build on that, and your clientele can tremendously grow. So that's what, uh, you know, I do, uh, uh, Anjali, that's how I started off. And right now in our firm, we started off with immigration. Then after that, we are into divorces. And after that, we are into personal injury now. We are into FLSA, that's Fair Labor Standards Act, employment law. Then we also do general practice litigation. So it's all about how you plan your footsteps and how you kind of basically, you know, discipline yourself. And in a sense, if you have that discipline, it doesn't take a lot. If you have the right tools of the trade, you can easily get there. And I'm sure that you can also get up, up to around 60 to 80 people. If not, I can promise you, if you even attend these sessions and regularly, and if you listen to me, if you're a lawyer, you'll start making money. So this is the beauty about our session. So we don't really share only the theoretical tips. Uh, so uh, when you are in the picture, you always share the practical tips, uh, which easily one can implement in the industry. Uh, so starting off with the first question, um, uh, sir, I mean, like you've been in the immigration practice for about 20 plus years. Uh, so is there anything to be scared about or the red flags that a lawyer should be looking for? So firstly, looking at me, do you feel that I've been around for 20 years? Are you trying to kind of uh, attack me on my age or something of that sort, really? <laughs> no, so I, just actually, enough. I was born on February 29, so I'm under 21 still. So, uh, all right. So let's get to the point. So. Your question is about, basically, I've been doing this for a long time. And what is your next question? Tell me. Um, so like I'm asking, like, can, what are the things that one should be scared of? Or the, what are the red flags that one should be looking for before, like, you know, entering into a case or entering yes. into immigration practice? Very good question. Uh, number one, yeah, also, Anjali, if you could speak a little louder, that will help a lot. So, you know, okay. that'll be fantastic. So okay. number one is that Everyone is scared and why people are scared is because of the fear of the unknown. And ultimately, it's up to you as a lawyer to take the courage to start an immigration practice. And what I've seen is that I can tell you my own story. This is a while ago when I was not doing bankruptcies in my practice. I went up to another lawyer who was actually like, you know, in my building. And I told him that I'm also planning on having adding bankruptcies. Uh, he was nice, but he was not too welcoming. Because for him, he looked upon it as me being his competition in the building. So end of the day, when you have decided that you want to start a particular area of practice, and let's start with immigration. So there are some low hanging fruits in immigration. And of course, you need a mentor. Why? Because your best client today can be your worst enemy tomorrow. And I've seen it all because, you know, I've been, been doing it for a while. I've helped people who run into problems, you know, uh, sometimes because of the clients. And a lot of people call me, a lot of lawyers call me sometimes to ask for advice and I help them out. So when you start a practice, the most important thing, and especially an immigration practice, if you are in an immigration practice, the number one thing I tell them is that you can easily start it and always have a retainer with your client. So once you have your retainer and in that retainer, you need to make sure that you spell out your duties clearly. That is also an ethical requirement for lawyers. Now, because they're a client, they're going to ask you for the moon. Simple example in an immigration practice is you started your practice, you're brand new to this practice. But I know that you're concerned that you want to be safe. So first thing is start with a good retainer. And after you start with the retainer, also let them know what is covered and what is not covered. The biggest problem which I've seen with new lawyers and even seasoned lawyers is they do not mention it in the retainer. 
So keep your retainer because a while ago someone asked me, oh, Mr. Gay, I'm just doing a simple retainer, you know, citizenship matter. Even if it is simple, tomorrow if you go to that interview, if that client was ordered deported and he lied to you, are you going to continue to represent him? Did he make it clear in the retainer that exactly that it's a simple citizenship and the client is not lying to you? So the importance of a retainer is very important in immigration cases. Then after that, what I do generally is, of course, like firstly, thanks to my legal software, and that's the software I use. So what I do is that in this particular software, uh, my legal software, I make sure that there are retainers here in the software. So I first uh, first thing that I sign up the client on my legal software. Then after that, it brings me up to the retainer page directly. It doesn't allow, allow me to skip. And I like that very much. So even if my paralegal is starting that, they're not skipping the retainer page. And I make sure that the retainer is there. And this is one good thing I like about my legal software. It doesn't allow you to skip the retainer. And if it does, then my secretary is in trouble straight up. So I know who did it, why it happened. This is a problem with a lot of law firms. Then after that, it takes me to the payment page wherein I hit the nail on the head that, listen, this is the agreement and this is what you're going to give me and I put it in the reminder section of my minus. Now comes the important part for a new lawyer. I mean, when you know that this is a new case, what should you do? There are some laws that you know you should know from the back of your head. Number one is you should know the Code of Federal Regulations and which means 8 CFR. And then after that, you need to know the INA, that's the Immigration and Nationality Act. And it's so simple that you can go on uscis.gov. Once you go on uscis.gov, the good news is that you can at least find, you know, the retain uh, the basic information. You can find the INA, you can find other things, and that can be very helpful to you. So you have to make sure that you have the basics in order. Besides that, what you also need, which is critically important for you, is what you also need with you is the right books in front of you. Now you're dealing with the INA, you're dealing with HCFR, you need to know the law and whether this case is okay or no. Now your client, for example, is applying for US citizenship. He has a criminal record. Now what will happen with a new lawyer? He's going to say, I am scared. I don't want to file this case. I don't know what should I do about this crime. Now this is where I come in uh, with my legal software. And you know, if you remember, we'll be happy to assist you with basic questions and tell you, hey, listen, this looks good. Now what you did, you're going to give away that client and now we make sure that you made some money out here straight up because rather than giving up that case, of course, I'm, uh, we work as friends with lawyers. We have many other lawyers I work with and we all work it out together and they're very happy. So this is one big benefit of what my legal software offers. And then after that, now you got the sudden chip client. You're also making sure that when you mail the application, you have the right documents. So I use the forms. And I make sure there's one thing ethically which we are required to do. And a lot of lawyers forget that actually. You should show that application to your client and tell them to read it. And uh, also like, uh, you know, in my legal software, I use that feature that when what they do, the client has to agree that I hereby agree that I've read the content. So tomorrow, assuming that you committed a simple error, you're, you know, you're filing an N-400 here. And if there's a mistake in his name, and then later on, that client is going to tell you, the name on my citizenship application is not correct. It was your fault. So you can show him that and let him know that you got away with that. So that's one thing which I basically do. I make sure ethically that I'm correct. I know the law. But there are times that even I don't know the law. Because law is a huge field. Take an example about a situation involving an aggravated felony. That's a topic that needs a lot of time and attention. So what do I do? I look at the categorical approach. I look at the matter of Nijawan. I make sure that it's good. That's why even experienced lawyers come in and they need help. Sometimes if I don't know the answer, I'll be honest and enough to let you know. But for example, if it's a crime involving moral turpitude, I can tell you from the back of my head that basically, you know, what, uh, 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 what we can do in this case is that, uh, you know, uh, we can apply for the 212H waiver. So it all depends on your case and the help is available here but I make sure that we cover everything out there.
Thank you, sir. So the mentorship was the main reason that we have come up with a free legal mentorship uh, with MYLS. Uh, so that was very critical and very you know important and asked for by most of the lawyers who join my legal software. Thank you so much for putting a light to it, sir. Uh, so, so the next thing that I would like to know is uh, like because you told there are so many complications in the cases. So, what are the easy type of cases like one should take as a new lawyer? Because basically, okay. So now, like you know, we have some people who already joined my legal software have been contacting you. So I get them started with the program. I told them, you know, now let's break this out down into two groups. The number one group is that uh, someone who has retired from a big law firm and he wants to make good money. And he says that I want to start a migration practice. And the good thing about these people is that they'll ask you very few questions, and they'll ask me, "Okay, just help me out here," and then I, I'm, I'm happy to just give answers. So when you're starting a practice over here, the first thing is that exactly what I tell them is make sure that you have the tools of the trade properly, make sure you have your books in order, make sure that you have a game plan, and the easy practice here is is family-based immigration. Start off with family-based immigration, and also like you know, uh, we give some personal lessons to people who want to know about family-based immigration. And through the family-based immigration programs, take an example: immigration is so easy to make money, and especially if you are in a small town, people think that I'm in a small town. Uh, there are not many immigrants. You'll be surprised; those people will find you because there's a paucity of lawyers there. And uh, I remember someone telling me that I'm in this small town. I don't know I'm, how well I'm going to do. So in the first month itself, he had five or six Hispanic people approaching him. So at the end of the day, the beauty of immigration is that people will approach you. And once if they approach you, we can start kind of basically, you know, talking to them. And uh, after that, if you're uncomfortable with something, now this guy has asked you a question. So you're a little kind of scared. The human scared, uh, scared as he crossed the border and he came in. He's married to a citizen. Can I apply for his green card? Look at how the question came up right now. So over here we can tell you, no, 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 no. Stop right there. He's not adjustable under Section 245A of the INA unless and until he's grandfathered under the Life Act. So that's how exactly you look at it. So you will be avoiding malpractice. Basically, you're making sure that you're advising your client properly, and not you're not coming uh, committing any ethical issues for yourself. Because suppose if you apply for this person, and if he has a criminal record, and if you're in a very conservative state, I've seen officers are so kind of some of them, some are so merciless, they didn't pick up your client. So it all depends. You know, right now this administration is good, but you have to be very careful. Now I know about a lawyer. What he did was uh, that uh, there was a case when the client had a deportation order, and he filled the 212 form, waiver of deportability, and he applied for the adjustment. The client got into trouble. So end of the day, because you need that TLC in immigration, tender love and care. You need someone, of course, you all are great. You all will do fabulous because if you read the law. But even today, I look up to some senior lawyers when I need help. And it's pretty normal. And as I said, we work as friends and we make sure that we it should be a win-win for everybody. That is how immigration practice should work. And one other request that I have to lawyers over here. Folks, uh, I'm going to talk about it at length because I've lectured uh, in the past at ELA regarding legal ethics too. So please do not file a Lozada against you know someone only if it's a exceptional situation then go for a Lozada because we are destroying the profession. So be kind enough, give the other lawyer a break because there's a saying in English that every dog has its day. Tomorrow it's his day, tomorrow it can be your day. So always watch your guard. That's true, sir. That's true. Uh, really important. Uh, so for the attendees, I would just like to give a gentle reminder that in case if you have any questions, you can post on the Q&A section on your screen. Alternatively, you can also mail us at uh, legalquestions at the rate mylegalsoftware.com. Uh, and you also have a chance to win a gift hamper if you take a screenshot or a picture of the session and post it on your LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram account and tag us along. Yeah, so sir, coming back to the pulp of the fruit, uh, is it easy to make more than $200,000 in first year of immigration practice? $200,000, yes, you can easily make it. Uh, let's take a simple math over here, all right? 
or client starts a marriage based on your question, approximately you make $5,000. Two clients started selling chips. You go for the interview, you made $2,500 from each client, $10,000 right there. That's basically you just start those things in one week. You already up to $10,000, that's $520,000 gross. So $200,000 is a number that is, of course, that's a gross number. So give or take, if you have one good paralegal, if you have the right tools of the trade, uh, then after that, yes, you can easily make it. And, uh, you know, people make immigration law difficult. Of course, it is complicated. It is very technical, but with the right mentorship, it's not difficult. You need to know the law from the back of your head. You need to know what is section 201, what is section 202, what is 203. I mean, you have to know the law. And if you don't know the law, go for help. And uh, the biggest thing which I've seen in my career when I appear before judges is that, you know, uh, of course, you know, uh, when I used to go for masters and individuals in the court, uh, half the time the judges would expect the lawyer to say, under what law? And the lawyer used to just stare at the judge. Don't do that, folks. You need to know the law when you're in the courtroom. Don't make a fool of yourself. Go to somebody who can kind of actually mentor you. Talk like a scholar in the courtroom. And I'll never forget uh, once I was before this wonderful judge in New York and her name was uh, uh, Judge Ferris, great, brilliant judge. And she asked me that, Mr. Gay, uh, can you tell me something? Uh, your client is an arriving alien. So I told her, yes, my client is an arriving alien. So she said, your client cannot adjust before me. So my answer was, no, judge, I respectfully disagree. My client can adjust because he went on the same application and he returned. And he's, not, he's adjusting under the same application. The government lawyer was very much surprised because the government lawyer didn't know the answer to that. They said that exactly. Then the judge said, Mr. Gay, under what? I said, it's CFR 1.1Q. The judge looked up 1.1Q and said, this is correct. And I gave the whole definition of what an arriving alien is from the back of my head. And the judge was impressed. So go like a scholar in the courtroom. And suppose the judge is even about to deny a case. For example, right, when you're fighting a case in the court and a, your client has a criminal record, just taking an example, be brilliant enough to cite the matter of array, A-R-A-I, let them know, judge, under the matter of array, the positive factors in this case are outweighing the negative factors. You're under the facts and circumstances of this case. He has a child, he, he has three U.S. citizenship, certain children, plus at the same time, he has been doing charitable work. The entire tone of the judge can change. That is true. Awesome. Uh, sir, so we've talked. You know, we've talked enough about the law part of the uh, thing. Uh, so, can you can you help us knowing like how to stay updated with all the legal, uh, you know, technologies? Like, what technologies do one need to be updated about before? Like, all right. So, in my case, uh, I'll tell you what all I use. I yeah. am, uh, of course, I use my legal software, and because we have a general practice firm. And this software is good for me to do matrimonial law. This is good for my personal injury cases. And plus the good thing is that it has an accounting feature and it has a lot of features which I have to go, have to go outside the portal. So that's number one. Secondly, I also use uh, Lexis for my research. Lexis is fantastic for legal research uh, because uh, you know the natural language is very good. And the third thing is that I also make sure that I have the INA in front of me, Immigration and Nationality Act. Then I also refer to basically Kurzban. Then I refer to Matthew Benders. Then I also look at Fragment Delray and Bernson. And I am more into like, you know, also I'm a member of AILA, plus I'm also a member of other bar association. But there's one thing I have in me. I read every day for one to two hours. That, so that, that helps a lot. And one other thing what I do is that in my legal software, anytime we, I write a brief, I create a template. That's what I like about this. I create the template and I keep it. So next time I have to just change it and I use it and it's a one, two, three. And uh, the other thing which I like uh, is what I do is when I'm doing the forms on my legal software, when I'm sending it to the client, I like one thing about the forms is that exactly the client cannot just download the forms over there. And uh, there's a watermark, so he cannot just print it and do what he wants. And if he changes it, I can just go there, do the minor change and wrap it up right there. That is helpful. So I finish it up over there. Then I use the Zoom feature because I have a lot of clients from you know different parts of the world. So when I'm on MYLS, I use the Zoom feature there. 
or I'll use Google Meet from there, get them across, do my consults, and even if I have to do a consult right now, I'll use that, and I start the case right there, and I add the data right there. So that's about getting client data. But after that comes the part of it where a lot of lawyers get stuck. And what next? I took up this case, what are the legal strategy? So in my case, because of my experience, I can tell you, you know, within a minute of what the legal strategy should be. Because one thing I want to tell a lot of lawyers, there may always be a case. And I'm going to give a fantastic example for this. So people sometimes go to a lot of law firms and they give up cases. A case came to my office wherein a person was charged uh, under, uh, sorry, was actually, uh, was denied under Section 204C of the Immigration and Nationality Act. And that is a big issue. And 204C deals with marriage fraud, which means immigration said that, uh, you know, you married this person with the intent of obtaining a green card. Now, this case went to a law firm and the law firm gave up the case. Why? This was an immigration lawyer, but he did not know what is the next step in the case because it's human. You always need your brothers to help you. And then when this person came to me, you know what I said? I told the person, keep talking to me. He spoke to me and he told me that, you know what, my wife deliberately did this. She doesn't like me and she's just being very mean to me. But she put it in writing before the immigration officer that her husband has married her for paper. Look at how difficult this case was. I took up the case. Actually, the husband did it. And the lady came in and crying. Then I went through the entire story and I basically applied for a parent's spouse and actually the case was referred to a judge and the judge heard the story and guess what? We won this case. We won this case. And this was in New York. Wonderful judge. Wonderful judge. I think uh, she just retired recently, but a great judge and we won this case. So end of the day, you may think you don't have a case, but speaking to someone who's been in the profession for a while always helps. And that's what we are here for. This is the beauty of my legal software. And it's lawyers helping lawyers. That's why we say that it's created by lawyers for lawyers. And sometimes I may have a referral for you. You may have a referral for me. That's the whole idea of creating this. And another reason I created it is because, uh, you know, I'm one of the founders, I'm not the owner. So as a founder, I see that there's so many features that we're missing in most of the softwares, not only from an immigration standpoint, but from a general practice standpoint, uh, the company had consulted us on regular occasions from my legal software. And we made sure that we added those features. Now, for example, at my master calendar hearing coming up in this case, I'm talking about the, the 204C, I make sure that I get my deadlines in order, I have my memos in order, and I put them up over there. So end of the day, that lawyer gave up this case just because he felt that nothing could be done on the case. And this is where you can also make that extra money. You may feel you don't have a case and it just take a simple phone call. I want to speak to attorney Gay, let him know. And I'll be happy to help you, give you a hand. That's the best word. And later on, it's up to you. And that's what we bring to the table here. Thank you, sir. So, I mean, so this is very important because uh, so my legal software was actually built by keeping this thing in mind. Uh, and it was built with extensive research from different lawyers and paralegals to take every single pain point that they have so that we can implement it in automated form so that you know people don't have to go through if their paralegal has left or if their lawyer has, lawyer has left you yeah, also like uh, you know anjali uh, the past has to practice class actions too and we are planning on getting everywhere and this is going to be a platform where lawyers will help lawyers and another exactly. thing lawyers should look upon them as friends not as competitions now, for example, right, I'm filing a DB uh, diversity visa lottery case in uh, Washington, D.C. So it was difficult for me to find someone, but I did find. So, but eventually, when we have all these great members joining us, we'll also tell the other person, he'll say, Mr. Gay, you have this issue. It's lawyers exchanging business with lawyers. And when you have a lawyer at the back like me, like at least, I mean, I can help you out and let you know, yes, uh, you know, John does it in Ohio. It's a win-win for everybody. That's the entire thing. A personal injury lawyer comes and joins us. He says, Mr. Gay, the thing is that I need personal injury cases. Come on and speak on this podium next time. Join me and let them know that you are a PI lawyer. Other lawyers will give you business. And we are open to those ideas. You just have to send emails 
to you know uh, i would say anjali and she's the main person in the company with priyanjali and all and they'll take care of the rest for you this is lawyers helping lawyers yes sir uh, uh, so anjali i think you have a lot of questions for me if you want you can ask me questions and then we can continue however you feel i'm okay with it okay sir uh, so how can we take our first court hearing before an immigration judge all right so now look at this great question how can you take your first case before an immigration judge now take an example you're this lawyer you know you're making this decent amount of money right now but you're scared you went to this great seminar and you attended abc seminar by so and so bar association but now you're scared you know why you're scared because when you have your hearing four days before that you don't have that bar session in front of you you want to ask that question over here oh my god how is the judge going to react we are there to help you for that look at the difference so mr gay recently a lawyer just called me and she took all these cle's and everything online but the answer was not there she said mr gay i know i have an asylum hearing coming up in court she said that i am prepared so the first thing i asked her did you review the eoir manual she said what is that new lawyer and i don't don't blame her for that secondly have you done your written pleadings what is that well i know the law i said yes you may know the law but do you know the procedures so we go through that to make sure that when you have your case at least you come out with respect from the court because you have two types of judges in immigration court and i've seen it in my entire career some of the finest human beings some of the finest judges are in immigration court but some of them are very strict and they are, they are super conservative and they will not hesitate to let you know that you come in next time in front of me i will make sure that you know i'll report you or something like that i've seen that also so because those judges are conservative because they mean well because they do not want you to spoil the life of that alien so end That's of the day alien is a term which is used in immigration law they want to make sure that you properly represent the person give you a simple example and you all are going to laugh about it because i have the audacity to be honest and upfront in front of all of you i took up a case and this case and if there are some seasoned immigration lawyers they're going to love it this case was in north carolina and north carolina is a very conservative state when you are basically uh filing for an asylum or when you're applying for anything so i had applied for the lead asylum and i knew that my client was very good very credible and after that we went for cancellation but the judge was giving us a grilling interview to see why did i even take on this case and we told the judge we had enough facts to let the judge know that judge this is a real case and that asylum was late how many lawyers would take it up in north carolina i did i did take up that case and we did very good on the case so end of the day it's your knowledge of the law that prevails and you know when the judge asked me questions he said uh, basically well the credibility factor uh, i said judge we need to look into cardoso fonseca and under cardoso fonseca 10% yeah i'm giving you more than that please into my client and finally he said i agree with you mr gay so don't be scared be a good lawyer and when you have the law on your side you do phenomenally well do you think that you know i've seen judges with due respect to them some of them are kind they're good they tell me that mr gay thank you for letting me know this i didn't know so you should be that lawyer who should actually be able to you know talk about the law over there of course i don't know every please don't uh, nobody knows everything but when i go for a case i make sure that i'm super prepared and uh, you know as i said right from marriage fraud cases find them out do you also know you'll learn something today folks in the marriage fraud case and i'm also going to make it a quiz my question over here to some of my viewers is what are the exceptions to a marriage fraud case other than bad spouse or oh, please write your answer down let me see how many people will reply without looking at the book so this is what we are going to do we want lawyers to get better here and i want lawyers to answer even law students can answer paralegals can answer it's learning at the same time this one hour will be very useful to every paralegal and every lawyer because you learn something new you you are going to learn something new you yes anjali your next question yes. uh, so i think now it's the time we can take the questions uh, because our question answer box has been piled up with a lot of questions so i'm starting with the questions from the attendees 
uh, first question is that I am already having family based immigration. How can I add employment based immigration to my practice? Okay, so exactly you need to, you know, uh, the right books. And you need to make sure that you understand the ABCDs. Employment based immigration, let's start with one or two simple examples. A big thing which people can really make a lot of money, which is really simple, is learning the H-1B visa. Simple. But people make a mountain of a mole because what happens, you read from the book, but ultimately you want someone to check it up for you. I can help you. I can tell you what you need to look at. This is missing in the profession. For example, okay. this is no kind of, uh, you know, uh, architect. And there's a small architect firm in your town who's telling you that, hey, listen, I found this great architect. Can you take over the case? Simple answer for a small law firm is, I'm sorry, we don't do this. And if they do this, they don't do something else. You gave up $3,500 to $5,000 on this case, on a simple case. You take, took over the case, said, so, Mr. Gay, can you give me a hand? All right, I'll give you some time. You know, we'll work out time, I'll give you some time. And then after that, what happened? You made a $3,500 because you've seen that there's a bona fide job I got. The guy has a qualification. And you start directly by getting the prevailing wages. Then after that, we get the LCA approved. We look at the prevailing wages, the LCA. Then after that, basically, you file the petition. Make sure that, you know, whether it's a master's degree or whether it's a bachelor's degree, make sure that's a credential evaluation. While it, of course, you have to make sure that your client is picked under the lottery, which is very important these days. Got picked under the lottery, you're done. File it and get it done. Okay. Uh, thank so you, sir. That's sir. about H1B. Okay. Then after that, get into something else. Get into the perm labor certification. Great idea. Start with the perm application for your client and get the green card done. So you've got two bites of the apple. Started off with an H1B and then you went on the perm. He retained you and you're making about $15,000 on this case. Of course, with India, there's a backlog. With China, there's a backlog. But the good thing about other countries is the employment based immigration is open. Now, some more things which I'll be teaching at these seminars and not many people know. Take an example, you're a client who comes in and he's from a country where there's a lot of problem going on. And example, okay, and he's from Syria. He's a br brilliant architect. He came in on a visitor visa. And after that, what he did is that you applied for the asylum. And his asylum is going on. His asylum is going on over here. And then the meanwhile, this architect finds uh, uh, this architecture company. But then he got his work permit on the asylum and he's working. Do you know that he may still qualify for adjustment while his case is pending before the IJ? And, uh, you know, a judge had asked me to cite the law and I did. And actually, a, 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 sorry, USC has had. And we were successful in that. So this is the difference when exactly you get kind of, you know, that roadblock. What do I do? What do I do? I may come to you. You may come to me. For example, like if there's a lawyer who's a part of MILS, I'll call him, hey, Jack, you've done this before. Can you give me a hand? This is what MILS brings, that unity, that friendship the ability to work together. And even if you're a PI lawyer, I may call you, I'll give you a case, or you give me a case. We're stuck on this. And we have a forum for that, internal forum, which is created for our people to talk if needed. And that's, I believe, your legal question that by legal software.com. Yes, sir. Next question. Uh, sir, just a, uh, yes, sir. So reminder to all the attendees, you can post your legal questions on legal questions at the rate mylegalsoftware.com. And uh, our attorney panel would be happy to help you from there. Uh, also, the uh, so next question is, uh, how do I decide on my charges for a case? Like how much to charge to a client? How, how do we decide? How that? do you decide that is basically depending on the facts and circumstances of the case. Now, for example, if your client crossed the border and they came into this country, you need to file for the provisional waiver because doing a waiver is a big job. So you can make a good fee of $10,000, $8,000 on those cases. Now, if a person who doesn't practice immigration, start your practice. Start it. What are you waiting for? Have the right person help you. At the, you know, you're sitting in Wyoming and you're watching the show. You're sitting in Hawaii. You're sitting in Alaska. You're sitting basically in Washington State. Watch it. Start your practice. We'll, we'll give you a hand. That's what it is. Uh, for example, <coughs> one of my my colleagues whom I trained, he's in Kansas, he worked under me, great guy, 
Ben Bombard, but no, he's very happy. His name is Ben. He started the practice. He's doing phenomenally well. Learned under me, folks. Ben Bob Gartner. So these are real life examples we are talking about. Uh, so next question is, uh, what is the intersection of divorce and immigration law? All right. Now take an example. A lot of divorce lawyers, they give up immigration cases. Why are you giving it up? See, you can make that extra money. Now you have this divorce thing and your person has a temporary green card. Do you know just by basically taking in a little bit of effort, you can tell the client that I'm also going to handle your immigration matter. Oh, I don't know immigration. A simple solution is we can help you to see how the documents are going to be crafted. And sometimes divorce lawyers who don't know about immigration, they just basically go for a no fault divorce and tell them, okay, you know what, you're out of this, that's it. Be careful, folks. Be careful. Because that can also hamper the client's green card. So you need to make sure that in your stipulation of settlement, in your stipulation of settlement and in the divorce, you have the right language crafted. Because if you have the right, right language crafted in the step, that step can be used in immigration when you apply for the green card. And besides that, as a divorce lawyer, you can take up that case and make that extra money and apply for this client who definitely needs a full service rather than a half service from you. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, so next question, like it's a very asked question. Um, uh, so the question is, how can I get a job or start my practice if I just completed my college? All right, uh, you can start a job. I mean, if you are an, uh, if you pass the bar exam, or uh, then you can easily look for a job and it's not difficult for you to start your own immigration practice or your provided of course you have to be ethical you have to be good and you have to there's nothing under the law that stops you from starting your own practice and uh, if you want to get into immigration uh, you can also send us your resume we'll look at it and basically approach lawyers approach law firms and tell them that you're ready to work hard and you'll become a good immigration legal and if you're a make sure that a lot of paralegals do a phenomenal job for the firm you know what they do is for example my paralegal is so good she'll look up all the technologies for me she'll educate me tells me hey mr gay this is good that is good and paralegals also let the boss know hey listen i want to attend this session because i'm learning a lot so make sure that exactly if you're a good paralegal or oh, you take these sessions because believe it or not even if you're at your current job, you may be able to move, be move on, you'll be able to move on to a better job, or you may be able to grow the current firm where you are. And we are happy to also assist paralegals who are working for law firms. If you're working for a law firm, want to join us, we are here to work with you. So next question is on the same lines. Uh, so one of our attendees wants to know that if I'm currently pursuing paralegal degree and want to start my practice on immigration law, uh, how can I do that and how can we help? Paralegals cannot start a legal practice, number one. You have to have a law degree to start a law practice, which means you need to have a JD, you have to pass the bar exam, be admitted, then only, then only you can start your practice. And at this stage, your best bet would be to work for a law firm, learn under them, go to law school, finish up your degree, then you start your law practice. Uh, so can this person send the resume to us? Like, they can, can send it and we can look at it and we can take it further from there. Next, yeah. Uh, uh, so what uh, what is the Lozada that you mentioned uh, in the uh, uh, session? Oh, yeah. yeah, so Lozada means ineffective assistance of counsel. Ineffective assistance means that uh, this is why I've, uh, you know, I've had some lawyers who ask me questions about this issue. And uh, what happens with that is that your client has filed a complaint against you because you messed up. And uh, I don't mind doing a lot of hand-holding if you're scared about your client and if something happens. Because there's a way of how you handle these issues. And if the client is yelling at you a lot at you on the phone, there's a way to handle those clients. And if you do the right thing, then nothing will come back to you or bite you. Don't violate the law. Believe in the rules of ethics. Make sure you know them very well. And if the client is just abusing his discretion by actually kind of yelling, screaming, and becoming abusive, then there are ways of how you handle those clients and that be deep.
they've been calling me actually. I mean, other people are trying to help them as much as I can. So next question is going to be one of your favorites. Uh, share some tips to handle some difficult judges and clients. All right, how to handle difficult judges and difficult clients? Have I seen difficult judges? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, difficult means in a sense they expect you to be very good at what you are. They mean well. They mean well. And always for me, you know, allow the judge to talk and learn to say the word I'm sorry, even if you're not sorry. I respectfully state I'm sorry, but I think I've done this properly. Look at what I said. You calm the person down, but tell them respectfully, judge, I've done everything within my reach. So you covered the ethics and without prejudices to my rights. That's the word which most lawyers don't use. Because in immigration, you don't learn litigation. If you're just a purely an immigration lawyer, my background has been litigation. My foundation has been litigation. I've done a lot of litigation. I used to do class action work before, you know, I started my immigration practice. I've done, you know, court related litigation because I have done it. And I, I used to co-counsel with the firm and we've done it together. So make sure that you're always on your guard, be respectful, be nice. And if you have a judge who you think, and if your client thinks is extremely, extremely kind of unfair to you, extremely is the word, then don't hesitate to file a motion to recuse. You'll see a big difference in the attitude of the judge. Don't be scared, but that should be your last choice. Last choice means when you feel that, you know, he has some personal agenda against his client or you, don't hesitate to do that. Well, that's your legal right. But please do not abuse it by just doing it all the time. That shows that you're not a good lawyer. That's number one. That's how you handle a judge. First, tell him, judge, I want to work with you. Then if the judge doesn't listen, speak to the clerk. Have a smile, then the clerk will tell you a lot about the judge. And one other mistake which lawyers do, you know, when in court or something, please, that good morning, good morning judge, good morning counselor, good morning court clerk goes a long way. Because if someone else goes on the top and if he's listening to you, they will know your politeness, the man on the top who's going to make a decision. You say, I think this lawyer was very polite. There's something wrong in the picture. Look at what you're creating a record. A good lawyer knows how to create a record. And when you're a good lawyer, in, I'm going to talk about this at London and other seminars, uh, uh, webinars on this. When you're an immigration court, I've seen a lot of lawyers don't even know how to object at an individual hearing. Learn to object. What is the definition of hearsay? You should learn from the back of it. How hearsay is a statement made by the declarant at trial trying to assert the truth of the matter in controversy. Know, know it, and even the judge will be what? This is a compound question. The witness has answered the question. My, my witness is not an expert, and the government is asking him that exactly. Can you tell me of how many people live in the country? My client is not an expert judge. He's a layman. Objection sustained. Or they say something which is something which you don't you disagree with, which is not a part of evidence. Judge, I respectfully state that the record should not reflect this. Because this is beyond the scope of examination. How many of you have actually taken the sidebar in the court? Learn to take a sidebar. And I'm going to talk to you about cases that have kind of won in the past. And they were like kind of basically like, you know, the chances were very slim, but by God's grace, we won them. That's what it takes for you. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to a lot of new lawyers here who really want to make it well in the profession. So that's how you handle the judge. Make sure that you're impressive. Be very respectful to the judge. That's important. Now coming to the client, the hard part. You know, sometimes there's a very good saying in English that intelligence has a limitation, but there's no end to stupidity. We all have seen it. And please do not hit your head against a wall. You're ruining your day. Worst case scenario, give that guy the money back. Give him a partial refund. That's why what I do in my legal software, I make sure that I document everything. I use the hourly billing feature here. And I make sure, hey, listen, this is the work. And tomorrow, if something happens, I have a complete list of activities. I pull the report from MYLS, which I've been using for a long time, and I send it out. Never had a problem with that. The problem is when you're going to tell the client that you're going to return nothing to him. 
but if you are sending a billing statement, even if he files a grievance against you, we are going to have lectures on grievance coming up very soon. We have a gentleman and a lot of lawyers who are here, they can also come up and speak. And uh, this gentleman, uh, Jody Felice, will be one of our speakers. He served on the grievance panel in New York for eight years and we will be calling him as one of our speakers. We also intend to call some retired judges from New York Supreme Court and matrimonial. Uh, Judge Tom Raphael has agreed to join us. So we're going to have some great news coming in very soon with some very, very, you know, kind of good seasoned people joining us, uh, with, uh, you know, with my legal software. Yes, sir. Thank you for that information for people. Uh, so, sir, we'll be taking the last session for the day. Rest of the questions we'll be answering uh, personally uh, because we don't have that much time at hand. Uh, so, the last question for the day we take is that what does a bar committee look up if there is a complaint filed against an attorney? Okay, they want to see whether you did your job. And uh, one of the most common things, this is my personal, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, experience dealing with lawyers uh, that I talk to and everything. And some of the colleagues that, uh, example, Joe DeFelice, whom I've spoken to extensively uh, in the past, people look at, and the people in the committee are very nice. Uh, I have a lot of respect for people who serve on the committee. But what the committee expects me to do, you to do, is be honest to them. Number one, be honest. If you committed a mistake, let them know honestly you did commit a mistake. Secondly, besides that, be very respectful to the committee. Rule number three, one of the biggest reasons why lawyers get into trouble is neglect. Neglect is a big issue or the case falls through the cra cracks. So for that, I use the assignment feature of my legal software and the reassignment feature to make sure, and I do a lot of audits in the firm to make sure that the case is sent out. If you have a non-cooperative client, write him a letter and close the file. So he's going to come and bite you in future. Say, I made those seven phone calls to you. You did not return my call. I'm sure a lot of you are listening to this for the first time and I'm sure you're all laughing. So end of the day, it's your job to make sure that you close up your file and ethically secure yourself. Besides that, another reason why lawyers get into trouble, I'm talking about some immigration issues, filing the wrong application, getting the client into deportation, not knowing what they're doing, no mentorship, nothing, file for adjustment straight up. Now, for example, you started this great immigration case. Now, brother sponsoring the sister. Oh, you have this. You finished up your I-130, and your brother, your, your client brother is here in the U.S. He's, he's on a B-2 visa, and immediately you decided to apply for his green card right there. So you finished the I-130 and the 485. Straight mistake. Straight error. You messed up his life. He's not adjustable, folks because you did not look up the priority date under section 203 of the Immigration and Nationality Act. And that client becomes illegal, he files a complaint against you. It's your fault. You did not have the right mentor. So make sure that you do everything by the book. You can go to any mentor, become a member of ELA, go anywhere. Do anything. You know, ELA is great. You know, work with any fantastic organization. Have someone who can basically assist you when you take up cases, especially when you're new. This applies to a lot of new lawyers. So that's very important for all of us, for sure. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, so rest of the questions will be answered personally. And uh, thank you so much, sir, for such a knowledgeable session. Thank you, everyone, for your precious time. Don't hit the leave button yet uh, before we end this session. Uh, so you're I'm here. Don't worry. I'm still here. <laughs> Uh, so before we end this session, your firm has been one of our clients and has been handling close to uh, 17,000 cases. 17,000 cases, yes. Yeah, my and you've been using software. my legal software, yes, that is correct. So like how, how, how is the experience going on? Like how is the... Superb. How is the we are very happy with it and thanks to the founders of it, including me and plus the people who are responsible, the tech team, my very special thanks to Priyanjali, to Urvashi, to Anjali and to each one of you. And uh, the tech team, what I like about them is that they keep progressing. And when they get the feedback, they're adding these new features. I was very happy to see the hourly billing feature. I was very happy to see, uh, you know, the reports. The reports are amazing. And besides the assignment and reassignment, but my paralegal leaves. Then after that, uh, people are unable to skip the retainer. So if something happens, I know what the fee was. Then the accounting feature is 
amazing. Then when I, start, when I start a divorce, I'm able to save them in, uh, in the uploaded files. And it's very easy to use. That's what I liked. And uh, also like when a new person starts the training, which I'll give is amazing. So I'm very thankful for you for helping us grow. As I said, we started off with few people and here by God's grace, we have offices in India. We have people, and the good thing is that uh, people working in the Philippines using the software, my parallels, I'm saving money. Then I have people, this is one software when I've been able to save money and have people working in India, in the Philippines, and Sri Lanka, and uh, you know, even in Nigeria, we have people working. So imagine this is what MYL is there for me. But of course, like you know what, if you're happy with something, be there. But if you want to change it, it's your choice. And that's how I am, like the straight shooter. And that's how things go. And above all, the biggest thing is that, uh, as I said, uh, my goal is to help lawyers especially personal injury lawyers who want to add immigration to the practice or any lawyer who wants to add immigration. If you're an immigration lawyer, you want to get into deportations, you want to start that great practice uh, to build your asylum practice uh, and uh, your litigation practice, deportation defense or employment-based immigration. You know, of course, I don't know everything, but I know a lot as much as, uh, you know, as much as I can, I'll help you. And the same thing, if you're a maximum lawyer, you want to add immigration. If you do closings and if you want to say, hey, you know what? I have all these fantastic amigos coming to me every day. And they say that I need my green card. Fantastic. And you know, always have this wonderful Hispanic gentleman walking to your office and say, immigrants or problema. See, no problema, son. You're buenos abogados, buenos amigos. Que problema. Get started, folks. Uh, yes, sir. So also as a founder, I would like to know, like, what are the next step for MYLS? Because we already have immigration speed in place. Uh, so I think we're also coming up with GP speed. So also we have a mobile app coming up uh, because the mobile app is important so that exactly, you know, the biggest thing for me as a lawyer is to have the, my deadlines on my kind of cell phone to make sure that everything like, you know, within minutes, I mean, not the basic version and advanced version is coming out. So what happens is that everything should be on my fingertips. Uh, I believe in the next level of technology. As far as I'm concerned, I have a background in law, I have a background in technology and of a background in media. So I try to make sure that I give as much feedback as possible to my legal software. And thanks to, you know, the founder, to the other founders and to the tech team for taking our feedbacks very seriously. And I think the best thing for people to do is, as I said, schedule a demo. You don't have to kind of go for it. And, you know, I think you're offering a uh, two week trial, I believe. Use it okay. and you'll feel the difference. And, you know, two weeks is free and there's no cost or obligation. Sign up call them and use it. And I can assure you that exactly then, you know, you like it, you'll say, okay, you know what, am I going to get the mentorship for a limited time that will be available. So just make sure that you go for it. Thank you so much sir, for bringing the light to all the points. I hope it was a knowledgeable session for all the attendees uh, in the session. Uh, this event was hosted by My Legal Software, which is an advanced legal case management software created by the lawyers for the lawyers. And so if you're looking for the best tools to grow and manage your uh, legal practice, then sign up for uh, MyLS, that is my legal software. And, uh, and next uh, week's session, very important, is going to be on next Thursday, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, how to basically, you know, try your first immigration case in court. How yes. to try your immigration case in court and what do you need to do, what do you need to know. Very important for people who want to start going to immigration court. Thank you. Yes. And this uh, advice is general in nature and does not apply to any specific facts or circumstances. And this is a general advice. It does not apply to any particular situation that you are kind of basically in court before, or, you know, handling before the immigration court. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your knowledgeable session. Thank you for your attendee. So go to My Legal Software, uh, try it for free for 14 days, no cost obligations, nothing. Uh, you also get heavy discounts as if you, uh, you know, sign, if you do our enrollment for this uh, month. And you also get, of course, free mentorship from our legal uh, council members. And we'd be waiting and would be willing to help you there. So also see you in the next session, Thursday, 3 p.m. You'll be receiving the uh, e emails on your address uh, for the next webinar session and the details. Of Above the all, if you like my session, please like us on Facebook and let your friends know that it's a great session to attend. I mean, for me, it's like being a lawyer. I love it when my other lawyer friends love this. And folks, as I said, uh, you know what? Uh, my knowledge is just a drop in the ocean. 
and I'm also here to I'm also here to learn from each one of you. Uh, God has not given me a chip on my shoulder, but my biggest thing is my favorite thing is that I will always be a student. I will never be a teacher. I'm here to learn from each of my friends who are going to be joining us. I'm here to learn from you more than anything else and share my knowledge which I've acquired. And I've handled 17,000 cases, as you all know, that I have a wealth of knowledge and I'd love to share with you, but also I'm here to learn from each one of you because there's no end to learning. Thank you so much. So that's, that's the spirit that keeps us all going. Uh, so thank you so much for joining in and we'll be seeing you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, sir.